Human beings are capable of horrifying, spine-chilling deeds. We've all heard of the worst evils inflicted upon innocents, and every year a new case stuns us into silence, making us wonder if there's a line humans won't cross. In this series, we're going to look at disturbing real-life crimes. This is Cold-Blooded Crimes. John Bodkin Adams was born on the 21st of January, 1899, in Randallstown, Ulster, Ireland. His family was religious and a part of Plymouth Brethren. Adams remained a member of this Protestant sect his entire life. His father, Samuel, was a watchmaker and also a preacher in the local congregation. He was in love with cars, and just like him, his son also took a great interest in them. Samuel passed away from a heart attack in 1914. At the age of 17, John passed his matriculation exam for the Queen's University of Belfast. Later, he got ill with tuberculosis and missed a year of his studies. In 1921, he graduated but couldn't qualify for honours. Surgeon Arthur Rendell Short offered Adams to be an assistant houseman at British Royal Infirmary. After not having any success there for a year, Arthur advised him to apply to be a general practitioner in Eastbourne, Sussex. Adams started living in Eastbourne with his mother, Ellen Bodkin, and his cousin, Sarah Florence Henry, in 1922. In 1929, he bought an 18-room house called Kent Lodge on a seaside road with the money he borrowed from one of his patients. He had borrowed £2,000, over 100000 in today's currency, from Mr Moorhood. He would often visit Moorwood's residence during mealtime, uninvited. Sometimes he would even bring his mother and cousin. At one point, he charged items to their account without their permission after shopping. He was a real scrounger. He used to take financial advantage of his patients and made a living from it. In 1933, Adams got engaged to Nora O'Hara. After getting a house from her father, Adams called off the marriage in 1935. The reason behind it is unclear, but he stayed friends with Nora his whole life. There were also rumours that Adams might be homosexual. In 1935, he inherited £7,385 from Matilda Witten, one of his patients. It was more than half of her entire net worth. Matilda's relatives challenged this in court to no avail. Shortly after this, Adams began receiving anonymous mail three to four times a year. The postcards were about him bumping off his patients. In 1939, one of Adams' patients, Mrs. Agnes's health, started getting worse shortly after Adams started her treatment. It continued deteriorating and her family got suspicious of it. They sought help from Dr. Philip Matthew, who concluded that Mrs. Agnes is fine and there is no reason for her to be treated by Adams. He also found that Adams was injecting her with a high amount of morphine. She was immediately removed from Adams's care and in a few weeks, she was good to live a normal life again. In 1941, Adam completed his diploma in anaesthetic. He managed to get a bad reputation at work, despite working only one day a week in a local hospital. He would sometimes fall asleep during work or mix up anaesthetic gas tubes. Sometimes his patients would wake up in the middle of operations. On June 28, 1948, Edith Alice Morell suffered a heart attack and was partially paralyzed. She was admitted to hospital near Chester and then transferred to Eastbourne on July 5th. From July 9th, Adams started injecting morphine into her and added heroin to the prescription on July 21st. Adams kept increasing the dosage as her condition got worse. She named Adams to inherit a huge amount of money and her Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost in her will in 1950. On the 13th of November, she passed away due to a second heart attack, according to Adams. Adams became one of the most successful doctors ever. It is believed that in 1956, Adams was the wealthiest doctor in England. He treated famous and rich people, and at least 132 patients named him in their wills. This rumour was spreading quickly and raised suspicions. In 1956, Gertrude Hullett began getting treatment from Adams. She was depressed after her husband's death. 
She was prescribed sodium barbitone and sodium phenobarbitone. Due to her depression, she was suicidal and Adams made sure to take advantage of it. According to him, he gave her two barbiturate tablets every morning. On July 17th, she wrote a cheque of £100 to Adams to buy a car her husband promised. When the bank said it would take until 21st of July to clear the cheque, he asked them to do it in a day. Two days after she wrote the cheque, she overdosed on her drugs and fell into a coma the next morning. During this time, Adams was unavailable and Dr. Harris took care of her. Together, they concluded it happened due to cerebral hemorrhage. When pathologist Dr. Scherer asked to examine her stomach contents, they denied her. Adams called the coroner for a private post-mortem. At this time, the patient was still alive. Not long after this, on July 23rd, at around 7.23 a.m., Hullet passed away. A urine sample that was taken two days before her death revealed that there were 115 grains of sodium phenobarbitone in her body, which was a fatal amount, likely leading to her death. Everything seemed very suspicious to the Eastbourne coroner, who notified the police that her death didn't seem natural. In turn, they conducted another post-mortem. The pathologists found out that the cause of her death was actually barbiturate poisoning. After the second post-mortem, two officers named Herbert Hanna and Peter Rawlinson from the Metropolitan Police took over the case. They looked into 310 deaths between 1946 and 1956 and found 163 of them suspicious. 42% of Adam's patients that died lost their lives due to either cerebral thrombosis or cerebral hemorrhage. These statistics were a clear indication that something was not right. The police questioned the nurses and the relatives of his past patients and got mixed reactions from them. Some were in favor of Adams, while some believed Adams caused his patient's death. They claimed that Adams sometimes used an injection he called a special injection and didn't tell the contents of it. He used to tell the nurses and the relatives to leave the room before giving injections. The British Medical Association told all the doctors to keep their professional scarcity if they get questioned by the police. This move caused problems in the investigations and it is believed that the BMA did it to save its reputation and for its own benefit. On November 24, Adam's house was searched for drugs such as morphine, heroin and pethidine. During his conversations with Hannam, Adams admitted that he gave his patients high amounts of morphine, apparently to ease their suffering. Unfortunately, these statements were not during interrogation and couldn't be used in the case. While the officers were distracted, Adams grabbed two bottles of morphine, but just as he was hiding them away in his pocket, Hannam caught him in the act. Adams claimed that one of the bottles was for his patient, Annie Sharpie, who died nine days prior to this. Adams was convicted of obstructing the search, trying to hide evidence and not keeping a dangerous drug record. Adams was arrested on 24th of November, 1956, on 13 charges. But later, he was released on bail and again arrested on the 19th of December. This time, it was for the murder of Mrs. Morell, which happened a few years ago. Adams was tried for Mrs. Morell instead of Mrs. Hullett, a case that was way more recent and had enough evidence. The whole thing seemed rigged from the start. The nurses testified that a lot of injections that were given to patients were from Adams' own bag and he didn't tell anyone the contents of those injections. Adams' defence lawyers claimed that his patients were already terminally ill and no murder was committed. Justice Devlin received a phone call from the Lord Chief Justice during the closing statements. He advised Devlin to release Adams on bail before Mrs. Hullett's case trial. Devlin admitted that he was shocked by it and that something like this had never happened before. On April 9, 1957, the jury announced their verdict. Adams was not guilty. The investigators were not happy about the decision and they suspected political interference. Adams was forced to resign from the National Health Service. He was again convicted of forging false prescriptions on July 26. He had to pay a fine of £2,857 and also lost his license to prescribe dangerous drugs. Adams began his duty as a general practitioner again on 22nd of November, 1961, and eventually he got his license to prescribe dangerous drugs back. 
Despite the rumors, his loyal patients continued with him, and he was back to living his normal life again. Adams also became the president of the British Clay Pigeons Shooting Association. On 30th of June, 1983, Adams fell and fractured his hip. He was taken to Eastbourne Hospital and later developed a chest infection and succumbed to it on the 4th of July. Some would consider him the most successful serial killer ever. If the rumors are true, he killed at least 163 of his patients and faced no consequences for it. He lived a luxurious life and at the time of his death, his net worth was worth 402,970 pounds. In today's value, that is over 1.2 million pounds. The only ones that suffered were his victims and their families. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. Until next time, 